All right, you guys, quit talking. Quit congregating in the corner. Sit down. I'll wait for you. I never do it the same way every time. God tells me what to say, and it just comes out. And sometimes I say way too much. And that last seminar in Alvarado, I said way too much the first day. So if you get a chance, watch that first day's video because they've been attacking me ever since. Day one of Alvarado. Yeah, Alvarado, Texas. And they've been after me ever since. All right, I want to start off this morning. If my phone rings and Bonnie calls, we'll interrupt it, okay? <clears throat> but, because uh, I do normally start off with a prayer every day, and t today is the Sabbath, by the way. And people always ask me, why do I do these things on the Sabbath? And it's because you are my people and this is my church. Okay? And Jesus, I was just going to say that. You, you stole the words right out of my mouth. And Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And he said, if your ox gets in the mud, take him out. And my people are in the mud. Okay? And that's why I do this on the Sabbath, too. And it's my center day. Okay? It's not that I'm breaking the Sabbath doing this. I, I feel this is the most important thing I could be doing on the Sabbath. And that's how I look at it. And one of the main places we all get in trouble is when we turn 15 and get our learner's permit and then our driver's license. And this is how they... they uh, they indoctrinated us into the system. They really did. See, with your passport, you have the right to travel anywhere. And a minor under the age of 18 using his passport to travel with his parents with him in the car, he can do that lawfully until he's 18 years old. And then he can do it without his parents. So the cabal, in order to indoctrinate you in there, they go to the kids in school, and now they don't even have to. Now the kids know it so well that they're teaching the other kids that, hey, if you want to be able to drive around on your own without your parents, at 16, look forward to getting your driver's license, see? And you can start at 15 with just a permit with your parent in the car. And I'll tell you what, on today's highways, I don't think a kid should be driving around unless you live way out in the country away from all big cities, okay? I don't think they should. They're not ready for it. They need to practice, practice, practice. When I was eight years old, my dad taught me how to drive the tractors in the field. Raking hay, pulling a rake behind an NAA Ford tractor, <laughs> and making windrows on 400 acres of hay. And I did that all summer long when I was eight years old. By the time I was 10, I was tearing those NAAs apart and rebuilding the transmissions. When I was 12 years old, my grandfather passed away. But it was about two months before he passed away, he sold me, because he couldn't drive anymore, he sold me his 1954 Willys Jeep pickup. And I'll bet you I drove that thing 20,000 miles and his tires never touched pavement. Okay, I grew up on a big ranch and 
behind the ranch was thousands of acres of national forest with logging roads. I came from a, as a farm boy from a mill town in Oregon. So there was either, you were either a logger or a farmer in the valleys. Okay, and that's how I grew up. And then I also got heavily into dirt bikes, things like that, race motocross, ended up getting good enough that Salem Honda sponsored me to race motocross. And I even got to race in the Kingdome one time when I was a teenager. So, as soon as I got married, that ended. <laughs> But one of the places we all get in trouble for the very first time in our life is because we're a driver in a motor vehicle, okay? The, there has been many, many books written on traveling by right. This one was written by my Southern Oregon group of the state nationals. Very good book. I have a legal brief that was professionally written by an attorney who's a state national in Washington State. And he wrote it clear back in 2009, and I have it on my computer. We've put it on some of the channels. And uh, I think uh, Scotty ha uh, Crelo has it on his website, okay, on the statenational.us website. That was a very well-written brief on, on the right to travel by a, an attorney. And you, I've used it to file in a court case as a legal brief that goes with an affidavit, right? A brief in support. <clears throat> Tony's put together a really good travel by right book as well. This one has a lot of Texas stuff in it. But usually what applies in one state applies in another. I have fought traffic tickets in Utah using the RCW, which is Washington State's laws. Because Washington State actually has some of the best laws on the right to travel there is. And yet they have some of the most brutal cops who won't allow you to do it. So their own, they break their own statutes. And if you don't know their statutes, you can't hold it against them. But I like to truck drive through Washington State. And every time I do, I make money. It's very profitable for me to drive through Washington State. Because I know if I go 20 miles an, over, uh, an hour over the speed limit, I'm going to get stopped. And the cop's going to do all the wrong thing. And when he does, I just fire banking law at him, which I'm going to write it on the board. You guys, I can remember back in 1990 where I wrote this with my wife's lipstick on the bathroom mirror. 72, 30, 15, 10, judgment day. You need to know that so well, and you need to use it in your everyday life for everything. All courts are banks. All judges are bankers. All, yeah, banking is the world, okay? So why not use their own banking law to help you? You have a 72-hour right to rescission anything. You got a 30-day first notice period. This is the same thing they do to you with a credit card. You sign up for a credit card, they send it out to you in the mail, you got three days to look at the conditions and accept it or not. And so you got a 72 hour right to rescind any contract. What's a ticket? A contract, it's an offer to contract. You got a 72 hour right to rescission that. 30 day first notice, 15 day second notice, 10 day third notice, and then it's judgment day. The problem is most people don't know how to take it into judgment on that end. So then they fail and they don't know why they failed again. 
kind of, we had that little talk. Yeah, see, <clears throat> I'm going to try and get that into your head today, how, you, how that works. So, Texas, Texas Transportation Code says that it's the things that they can not do. Registration by political subdivisions are prohibited. It's the same with U.S. law. I'll read that to you here in a second. <clears throat> The state may not require an owner of a motor vehicle, may not require an owner of a motor vehicle to register the vehicle, pay a motor vehicle registration fee, or pay an operation tax or license fee in connection with a motor vehicle. Then it allows the state, the authority, to regulate a municipal business if it's in the business of transportation Uber, taxi, right? Buses, things like that. Or in a commercial activity. Or if it's a public servant in the performance of their duties. A fireman's got to be licensed to drive a fire truck. An ambulance driver has to be licensed to drive an ambulance. A cop has to be licensed to drive a cop car. But the one he stops is you. And you don't have to be. See? And this is one of the biggest places we all get in trouble. It's codified all over the place when you look at it. I mean, it's in it's the CFR, the USC. It's Well, answer it for me. Well, you got to answer it. And then yell at me. Throw something at me. There she is. $50 a day I put on that thing. Thank you for using GTL. Hi, baby. Hey, good morning. How are you? We've been waiting on you. You have? Yeah. Really? I thought it was yeah. like 9.15. We started at 10. It's 10.25 here. What time is it? 10.25. Yes, we are. I told you that yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's 9.25 here, so I'm off an hour. Sorry, baby. That's okay. We're right in the middle of class, so you want to pray for us, or do you want to be prayed for? Or both? Well, I do want to pray, actually. Say, say hi to everybody. Everybody say hi. Good morning! you so much. Well, in my life, I have been asked in my situation to have an attorney appointed to me, and I refused, and the judge is trying to force one on me. But biblically, it is against my religion, and I want to share with you this scripture, because the danger of having an attorney means that the court has jurisdiction over you to do with you whatever they want to because they will keep it a private bar guild matter and keep the Constitution out, which is dangerous for us. So based on my religious beliefs, I can quote scripture and tell them I don't consent to an attorney based on what God tells me. And that's found in Psalms 94, verse 20. Very good information to know. Here, here's what the word of the Lord says. To shout the throne of iniquity which devises evil by law 
have any fellowship with you and condemn innocent blood. Oh, pardon me. Have any fellowship with you. They gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. And that is exactly what the attorneys will do with the judge. They will sign their own clients off to prison and to jail by signing their own clients away into slavery. <clears throat> but the Lord has been my defense and my God, the rock of my refuge. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord, our God, shall cut them off. So um, I highly recommend anyone that a, an attorney They'll even try to assign a standby attorney and you have to stand up and say, no, 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 I don't consent based on my religious beliefs. Psalm 94 verse 20 is what I just read to you. They devise evil by law and they condemn innocent blood. And um, what, what have we to do? What counsel have we to do with them? We don't. God does not want us in that relationship with the wicked. David? Yes, dear. I, I, I just want to I just want to pray over everyone. Go ahead and, and then I too. have a young lady who would like to pray over you. Oh, great. So, so go go right ahead, honey. Okay. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you this day. This is your Holy Sabbath day. You answer more prayers on this day than any other. We see that when um, your own son walked on this earth and did more healing on the Sabbath day than any other day of the week. We praise you, dear Lord, and we thank you. We give honor and glory to your name, for you are mighty and you are awesome. We praise you, dear Lord, for um, bringing all these people together that are hungry and thirsty for truth hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Dear Lord, you are raising up a righteous current against wicked that has sweep, swept over our nation. And dear Lord, we know that it's divine prophecy. We read that um, yesterday in Isaiah 59, verse 14 through 19. We thank you for the promises all over scripture that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you will deliver us from them all. And we thank you for those promises, and we claim them, dear Lord. Your word is not to be returned void. You are not a liar. You're only a truth teller. And when you say you will do it, you will do it. I pray for a hedge of blessing and protection for all those in the room that are listening to the seminar, dear Lord, that you would bless each and every one of them, that you would turn on their heart lights, that they would never go out that they would stand firm in righteousness no matter what to their very last breath that's in them. Dear Lord, we long to see you face to face. We long to be there on that day and hear those words from your mouth that says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I praise you, dear Lord, for these people, that they would be righteousness in their own nation state, that they would go back home to wherever they're from and just be a light that cannot be put out. Station your holy angels around them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with zeal and excitement for truth. Full of love, full of righteousness, and full of your word. I lift up David to you, dear Lord. And I pray for strength and blessing over his body as he has been um, attacked in many ways with his health um, in the last few days. I just pray that you give his voice strength that you bless his feet and his legs and his back and his shoulders, neck, his mind and his mouth, and that the words that come out of his mouth would be from your throne room on high. That you would speak through your willing vessel, David, Lord. I thank you in advance for also the miracles you promised us, that justice will return to the righteous. And dear Lord, we know that that's found in Psalm 94, verse 14 and 15. I thank you, dear Lord, for all your miracles that you're planning to work through us, that you would use us as your hands and feet in this nation to do your will. I thank you, dear Lord, for blessing David with your Holy Spirit, filling him completely and stationing your holy angels around him and everyone else there. Your will be done, dear Lord, in Michigan. Your will be done in Texas and all over 
our 50 plus nation states. Dear Lord, change us back to the righteous government that we had once started off with in the very beginning. Your will be done, Lord. Your kingdom come. And we claim those promises in John 14, 14, that anything we ask in your name, you will do it. So in Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Bonnie, we just want to make sure that you know that you are loved and prayed for and lots of us have fasted for you and I was praying last night for you and God told me to come and pray over you. Since you've been praying over us, we need to pray over you. So Lord, I just pray for Bonnie. I pray that you put the hedge of protection over her that you say you do, that you're going to be with her and that all that come across her will come to know you and will bow their knees and worship you and know that you are God. That no one will go untouched, even when Bonnie looks at them, that they will feel your love and your protection. Give her the words that she needs and let her know how much she is loved and cared for. We love you, Lord, and we know that you have us in your hands and that you will get her out of this the way that you want her out. Let her use this experience to teach everybody the right way to do things. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, sweetheart. Love you. Thank you, honey. I'll Thank you for your prayers. I appreciate it so much. I'll talk to you later, okay? okay. All right. Love you, baby. She is so strong, I think it's harder on me than her. Thanks for all your prayers, you guys. Every one of you has been praying for us. I've had a, I've had very tough nights. Okay, I got a little sleep until uh, about four o'clock this morning, and I. Uh, just before I woke up, it was like my body couldn't move, but my mind was reeling and having nightmares, and I felt an extreme pressure on my chest, and I was having a hard time breathing. And I had a ceiling fan going right above the bed, and I shouldn't have had a hard time breathing at all, but I did, and I felt like something was putting pressure on the bed like this. And that's exactly what it felt like and what it sounded like. And I was having a very tough time breathing. And you, I don't, I don't know what you all believe or don't believe in your heart, but they have been hitting me very hard with some kind of an energy weapon something. Two days since she's been in jail, I actually thought I was having a heart attack. My chest hurt, my arm hurt, my, my neck was hurting, my head was pounding, and I got down on my knees and I prayed both times immediately, 
and commanded it to leave, and it left instantly. And that happened to me before. Back in 2013 in September, on September 30th, I was up on a ladder in Michigan, I mean in Minnesota, in Minnesota, the other M state. And uh, building a big hydroponic building on a dairy. And I was up on a ladder and I had a stroke. Now I want you to know I had never had heart problems before that, ever. In fact, my heart tests very, very strong when I go to the doctor. But I had a stroke. And somehow I made it down off the ladder. I made it about a thousand feet away to a little single wide mobile home on the dairy that I was staying in while I was building the building. And I sat down on the bed with my boots on, my work clothes on and everything. And I just laid backwards. And the next morning I woke up in that exact same position with all my work clothes on, on top of the bed, laying sideways with my boots on. And I felt fine. So I jumped in my truck and I drove 30 hours all the way back to Bend, Oregon. 10 days later, and that happened about four o'clock in the afternoon on the 30th of September. 10 days later, at four o'clock in the afternoon, I had a heart attack. 10 days after that, at four o'clock in the afternoon, I had another heart attack. I ended up having five strokes, six heart attacks, exactly 10 days apart, exactly at four o'clock in the afternoon, all the way to January 10th. I was seeing one of the top heart people, doctors in the country, and he kept prescribing me shit. And I'm against pharmaceuticals, but he was telling me if I take, don't take this stuff, I'm gonna die. And it was, these heart attacks and strokes were showing up on, the, on their equipment. <clears throat> and I, I would take one pill the first day and God said, "Never, don't ever take another one. So I put the lid back on the bottle, and I wouldn't take it. And then 10 days later, I'd have another issue, go to the same darn doctor, and he'd prescribe me something else. Try this, because I told him it made me sick, and God told me not to take it. And so he'd prescribe me something else. 10 days later, it happened all over again, and I'm taking something else. Every time I took one pill and I got sick and God told me not to take it. So finally, I got sick and tired of that crap, January 10th, and I gathered it all up and I walked into the doctor's office and I set it on his desk and I said, here, you can have all this shit back. I said, I'm not gonna take it. He goes, you don't, you're gonna die. I said, I already dug the hole. I put the pile of dirt right next to it and I parked the tractor with the bucket right in front so my now ex-wife could just push it and cover me and I'll crawl down in there and lay. I said, I'm not afraid of dying. I did. I went home and I dug a hole with the backhoe. And I dug my own grave. And every time this happened, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And around the, I'm not sure exactly which day, around the 15th of January, God says, you're going to be fine. Get your ass off the ground. Kicks my butt and says, go out there and work. I'll protect you. And I felt protected every since until the last two weeks. But... All this started happening after my seminar in Alvarado, day one. Whatever I said, 
piss somebody off enough that I feel like they're hammering me. And I read you yesterday the note they sent and delivered to me. They even had sent it and admitted that that's what they're doing. So, uh, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you for your prayers. Turning a right into a privilege under color of law is a conspiracy against right and in violation of 18 U.S.C. 241 and 242. I've been teaching 241 and 242 for a long, long time. Now, in section 42, see, you guys got to make the United States Code your friend. Because this is how we hold our public servants accountable, okay? So, section 42 is the civil code of holding them accountable in a civil way. Section 18 is in a criminal way. Section 26 is the IRS code. Section 12 is about contracts. On and on and on. You need, section 8 is about status, standing, jurisdiction. You need to make the United States code your friend. Okay? I know it'll make you fall asleep reading it. But it's very important. And it lays out a fee schedule for you that you can file with the county and you can post it on your property with signage to charge them. And once your fee schedule is recorded in the county, if the county comes after you, it's like the menu at McDonald's. How much does a hamburger cost? If you come into my shop and you buy a hamburger, here's what it's going to cost you. You trespass against me, here's what it's going to cost you. See? And those fees are right out of the code. It's not SMU. It's not something we make up. If you use the code properly, it will reward you greatly. See? And this is how I bill police officers. And believe me, they pay. And you get nice checks. I just recently got one. And my bank account went from about 20,000 or so average to 100 very quickly. You've got to know what to do. It's nice when they drop 75 grand into your bank account. Normally, I charge them 10,000 if they're nice for stopping me on the side of the road. The minute they do, they're, they're violating your rights. A simple rights violation to a guy that's nice, it's $10,000. If he's not so nice, it's $75,000. If he does to you what this last idiot did to me, it's two fifty. dollars I'm waiting for that check. It'll come in a few months. Trust me, because I'm going to do this process. Right now, I'm focused on Bonnie, so I'm going to let my stuff wait for a minute. It's not as important. But as soon as I get done with Bonnie, I'm going to hit them. I've already warned them. How do I warn them? I put in a preservation letter immediately. Write this down. A preservation letter. A preservation letter is nice. It says, Dear Police Department, on such and such a night, a couple of your officers named, and you get their names, pulled me over and did this and this and this, right? And in the event, since they violated my rights, in the event 
that I may sue in the future in the event that I may sue in the future, I need you to preserve all evidence. I need you to preserve all evidence. All sticky notes, all memos, all traffic tickets, all 911 calls, all, all telephone records, all telephone conversations, body cam footage, blah, 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 every little thing you can think of that they might have, you spell it out on that preservation letter in the event that you may sue in the future. And you have to do that right away because they'll just destroy evidence. Once you do that and they receive it, they can no longer destroy any evidence. So the day I got out of jail, My preservation letter went in the mail to him and it was delivered the next day. See, I'm already warming up. It's coming. This is why my, my uh, you know how when they take a picture of you in jail and put your mug shot up, it's, it looks like you've had the worst day of your life? What did mine look like? Mine's the most beautiful mug shot picture I ever saw. See, I knew that I'm going to make some money. And it could be profitable. I've done it before many, 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 many times, so I know it works. Guys, that's so important. Preserve that evidence in the event that you may sue. Now all you got to do is subpoena the evidence. Super simple. And they break every law in the book. Now they're providing you with the evidence that they broke the law. How beautiful is that? But if you don't put in a preservation letter, there won't be any evidence that they broke the law. I guarantee those body cam footage videos will get erased. Uh, all the records will get erased. They've already tried to wipe me off their computer system like I never got arrested in the first place. Believe me, I got two pieces of paper that says I was, so they can't hide that. It's in my possession, see. It's a beautiful thing, it truly is. You can't stop somebody from being wrong and doing the wrong thing. I couldn't have prevented that, okay? I did everything I could to try and educate the man so he would let me move along freely and go get some tacos and I ended up hungry all night and I was pissed. I, I get hangry, ask my wife, okay, hangry, okay, yeah, all right, most men do, all right, that's why we have wives, because they don't want us hangry, okay, it's our preservation, <laughs> right, crimes of this nature are subject to fines, and not more than 20 years of imprisonment or both. Do you understand? I have sued officers in federal court. And when you drag them up on the witness stand and you question them in front of a jury, the jury almost always sides with you, not the officer. Because you can show you have the opportunity to show the jury all the laws that they're breaking. And even those jury members have had tickets and bad experiences. And they can't hardly find any that haven't. That's how bad they've been. How many in here have never had a traffic ticket? Raise your hand. Yeah, four people, five. Five out of the whole room. Six. Okay, six. What? what, you're afraid? Stop it. Go. Be proud. Okay, six people out of 150 people. How hard is it for them to find those six to put on a jury? If they don't drive, that didn't count. So if you don't drive and you raised your hand, put your, 
raise your hand again so we know. Okay. One. Okay, so now it's five. Five out of 150. All right. You didn't count. <laughs> ah, it is a crime for a powerful corporation like the county to abuse the process and attempt to overpower the individual with swarms of officers and a huge war chest. You know where that came from? Those words? Right out of the antitrust laws at 15 USC articles one through seven. It's illegal for the county to overpower the individual with swarms of officers and a huge war chest. That's an antitrust law. Why is it called an antitrust law? Because anyone acting and pretending to be government is our fiduciaries, our trustees. We are the beneficiaries. We are the creditors. We're the full faith and credit of the United States government, and they're under trust to protect us. And when they violate their trust, we use the antitrust laws, and we make money. Don't let them get away with anything. That's what keeps you broke. You spend all your time in a J-O-B, making $20 an hour, or $25 an hour, or 50 an hour, or whatever it is you make, when all I do is sue them three or four times a year and I can make a half a million. Do you get that? There was a kid, he was out of Texas, I was out of Oregon. And he was out of Texas and he was about 27 years old and he came to one of my seminars that that seemed to be the subject that God wanted me to talk about. So I taught him all this. And boy, that little guy, he soaked it all up. And not only did he soak it up, he flew to Oregon and he spent a week with me up there and just hanging out, following me around and asking me questions. And he bugged the crap out of me. But I learned to like him after a week. I didn't like him at first. He was... He was a persistent little man. And I had things to do, and he was taking up my time, and he was adamant about it. But he wanted to learn, and I saw his hunger, and I learned to love him. And a couple years went by, and we had talked maybe once a month for a while. You know, it kind of phased out two or three times a week to once a month to once every three months to once every six months. And then I just kind of lost track of him. And January 5th through 10th, when I'm in Washington, D.C., doing a whole bunch of stuff, he called me. I don't remember which day, but he called me. And I hadn't heard from him for a long time. And he goes, David, are you still doing that uh, seminar stuff? You still teaching? I said, yep. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm enjoying life so much. I got married. I had a couple of kids. I just do whatever it is I want to do. We all go shopping. We all have fun, and we just do whatever it is we want to do all day long. I said, well, what are you doing for a living? He says, well, you taught me. I'm suing government. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And he says, well... And he started telling me a couple little stories and, uh, about little events that he did, and he won, won some money. And I said, well, how much are you make in a year? He says, oh, I make four to 500000 You understand that's a kid who's like 32 years old now, maybe 33 years old. And he's making four or five hundred thousand dollars a year, going shopping and driving, traveling around with his family and enjoying life and, and and spending money and not a care in the world. And every time they stop him, he makes money. And 
And I'm sure if he's like me and he's got an extra half hour to kill, he speeds up when he sees a cop. It's a beautiful thing. Any attempt by the county or state to convert a claimant's property into a commercial asset for the benefit of municipal corporations without just compensation is a tort demanded in, as in the city of Monterey versus Monty Dunes. Monty Dunes sued the city of Monterey. Actually, the city of Monterey sued Monty Dunes. He countersued and he won big, see? And that was one of the quotes out of that, out of that case. The antitrust laws violate the Sherman Antitrust Act and the Clayton Act, Clayton Antitrust Act, and are in place to protect the individual from power tactics used by the state. They're there for our benefit. I'm sorry, what? Okay, we are all individuals. And that is a word that you're gonna to have to look up the definition in, in everything you do. If you're using the CFR, it means one thing. If you're using the USC, it means something else. If you're using, and it all means different things. See, this is what attorneys have done to us. This is why you gotta go back in time to older dictionaries. If I want to know the meaning of the words written in our founding documents, what dictionary am I going to turn to? Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. That's where I'm going to turn. Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. That was the first Webster Dictionary. You've got to remember, Daniel Webster, Noah's father, was one of the young son heroes of our founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson and Sam Adams took those documents, the rough draft, to Daniel Webster and said, here, make them perfect and timeless. And he did. That's a guy you hardly ever hear about. You hear about Adams and Jefferson, but you don't hear much about Daniel Webster, and he's one of our founding fathers that made those documents perfect and timeless. One in the course of human events that becomes necessary for one people. You understand how perfect those documents are? Know them, read them. Order certified copies from Washington, D.C., and when you get those certified copies back, they've been shrunk down so much you can't even read them. Doesn't matter. Sign your name to them, date it, stamp it with your seal, and go record those four documents in your county as the laws you stand by. In fact, take a picture of the front of your Bible and put that it with them. See, in the very beginning of the United States Code, it says, in its preface, it says, this nation was founded upon Christian principles, i.e. the Bible. And Congress passed Public Law 97-280, confirming the Bible to be the word of God and the law in this nation. Use it. Make it yours. Put your name on those papers and record them with your affidavit. These are my primary source of law. And put the Bible right on top of those four founding documents with your affidavit and go record it. With your stamp and your seal and make it yours. And now I'll walk into court and say, Your Honor, I've already put it on the public record that these are the laws that I go by. And any of your laws, they're just shit made up. If they don't follow this, they're null and void on their face. And the United States Code says that right in the preface. 
It says all laws of the United States shall be based upon the Bible and these four founding documents. What are those four founding documents? It's called the Ordinance of 1787, better known as the Northwest Ordinance. The original Constitution. Nope. The Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation. The Magna Carta is what all those are, documents are based on. And by the way, five of my grandfathers in 1215 signed the Magna Carta in 1215. Know your history. Know your heritage. Know what's in your blood, in your DNA. See, they didn't put anything in my DNA like fear. They didn't put it in there. I don't have that in my blood. And if I do, it's suppressed so badly, I don't see it. Grow some of that. Okay? Grow some of it. It's important. We're losing this country. Now, in the end, we know we won because God tells us he, we already did. But by gosh, he tells us that because he knows we're standing up. And if you just sit back and wait for God and don't stand, well, then you're not a part of his plan. Think of it that way. I love our mama grizzly bears in this country. Women, I salute you. I see the women in this country standing up better than most of the men. And it's not all the men's fault. The older men look at the younger men like, where the hell's your testosterone? You might as well be a girl. Yeah, and a lot of them are. Women, I feel sorry for you that there's not enough real men out there. Be, their, be your husband's queen and build him up constantly and he'll fight for you. If you tear him down, you spend your whole day tearing him down, well, then you got a girl for a husband. That's what you'll end up with. Bonnie spends her life building me up taking care of me, kicking my ass, so I'll go out there and fight. And I get up every morning and I fight. That's what we need to do to save ourselves and our nation and our brothers and sisters of this world. And we've got to do it. And I fight many battles on many fronts every day. Today has barely gotten started. And I already returned two emails on two different subjects that most people don't even know I deal with. I want you to know that. I fight on many different battlefields every single day. You need to do the same. We can't do it alone. Not one of us are going to be successful fighting alone. We need all of us, okay? All right. The Supreme Court ruled that municipalities cannot exert any acts of ownership and control over property that is not owned by them. They can't do it. That's in Palaz. Oh, I'm going to screw this one up. Palazzola versus Rhode Island. It's a 2001 case. It's a fairly recent case, and it's a very important case. There is no expiration date on the taking clause for city's illegal enforcement of its codes on any man's private property or restricting any man's private business. This is why PMAs are so great. Marcel has been doing PMAs. If you need a private membership association, go see Marcella. I taught her how to do it. She's learned well. She's smart as a whip. I love her to death like one of my own daughters. I just love her. We've had a lot of history together, haven't we, honey? 
a lot of painful times, a lot of crying times, a lot of a lot of hugging times to get through things. And uh, she is awesome. I keep telling her I have to do background checks on her boyfriends because none of them are going to be good enough for her. Okay, she's an angel. So. Affirming that is Lucas versus South Carolina Coastal Council, a 1992 case. Activists and code enforcements cannot restrict development of a man's private property unless they lawfully acquire the land first. And surveying with binoculars constitutes a taking. Have you ever had a drone fly over your house and wonder what the hell that is doing up there? That's surveying with binoculars. And the counties are using those drones now to assess properties and assess taxes. They're flying over your house. Real estate agents use them to take pictures of property and put it on listings. They hire private guys who you don't even know, who are probably 21 years old and the son of a friend of theirs, to fly over your house with a drone and take pictures. All your cities, your counties are doing it. Deschutes County, Oregon, last time I checked, owned 11 drones that they're using to spy on you and your private property. They're looking for ordinance violations to see how many dogs you have without a kennel license, to see if your horses are taken care of, if you're farming the right crops. The USDA is using it on it against farmers. They're using drones. Lucas versus South Carolina Coastal Council. Just like that. Look, uh, don't make me go backwards. Palazzo, see, that's the one you want. You did that on purpose. Palazzo, you know, Italians. They either end in an O or end in an I, and you know. Notice the agency in all signators, fair warning, not as a threat. And that's pursuant to United States versus Lanier on Satori. That's a Supreme Court case. It hereby informs this agency as corporation staff and personnel that any violation of the claim as God-given rights will be enjoined in a lawsuit as a conspiracy against rights by action under color of law and will be filed under Title 18 of the USC, Section 241, is a deprivation of rights under color of law, and 18 USC, Section 242, under conspiracy against rights, which is punishable by fines and imprisonment. Put them on notice. Do it ahead of time. Then if they do it, you say, look, I provided notice. Now, you were just merely asking the judge for a summary judgment based upon the fees that you've filed, and life gets easy. Your lawsuit's easy. Here, here's a picture of the drone. If they took it over their heads, I'd already put them on notice, and I'd already filed my fee schedule, which came right out of the United States Code, Your Honor, into the public record. So they knew that what they were doing was wrong and they did it anyway and thereby they violated my rights. So I'd like to move to request a summary judgment and let's finish this thing right today. Just settle it according to the United States Code. Boom. The case just got over in about a minute and it's done.
The United States Code is designed to hold our public servants accountable, not our neighbors. Hey, follow the book of Daniel on how to deal with your neighbors. Okay? Tells you. Well, if you can hunt them down, drag your, get their license plate number, make model their car, some form of proof, yeah. I would then go to them directly and ask them what the hell they're doing, taking pictures of your house without your permission. This is your private property, right? Okay. You know, <laughs> this little cop that arrested me the other day, one of the things I said to him while I'm waiting in the back of the car and they're shuffling through my truck is I said, hey, you know, the United States Department of Transportation puts out something called police visor cards. I said, go to their website, hit their search engine, type in police visor cards if you don't know anything about it. And he looks right at me and I go, well, do you? I was being a little bit of a smart ass because of what happened to Bonnie that day just a couple hours before. I, I said, so well, do you? I don't recommend that. Be nice. <clears throat> and he goes, no, what are you talking about? I said, go to the U.S. Department of Transportation's website, go to the search engine, type in police visor cards, or watch one of my seminars where I've got a book with, with uh, QR codes, and you can just click on it, and it'll take you right there. I said, and I didn't have this with me, so I didn't show it to him. But I said they make police visor cards. You can download them, you can cut them out, you can laminate them, and they're made to go up on your visor so that you know what a commercial vehicle looks like because that's all you're supposed to stop. Where's my Chevy Silverado? It ain't on there. Where's your Toyota Camry? Where's your Lexus? Where's your little Mercedes SUV? Or your Volvo. It ain't on there. This is all they're allowed to stop. It's got buses and 9 to 15 seat vans for hauling passengers. It's got all kinds of commercial vehicles all over it. On Highway 67, on the way between Alvarado and Dallas, there was a police officer who pulled over a commercial vehicle. I know, I thought I was going to have some fun, and I had an extra 10 minutes to kill. So I swung up behind his car, and I stopped, and I got out. And he was sitting in his car, and I said, walk up to his, and I say, officer, roll down the passenger window, because you don't want to walk up on the, in Texas, they'll just hit you. They just run you over. Walk up on the passenger side of the vehicle and ask him to roll the window down. I said, officer, I just wanted to thank you today for stopping commercial vehicles and not private ones. And I pointed at my truck. I said, have a nice day. Thanks for doing your job. Appreciate it. And I was on my way. Take the time to educate your public servants. It only took me about 30 seconds, maybe a minute. And I'm back on the road. But he was actually pulling over a commercial vehicle. Let him know. Codification of the lack of jurisdiction by the United States Department of Transportation. I understand every police officer has to work under the transportation code. They don't even know the freaking code. They're only taught three or four little sections on what to do to stop somebody. They're not taught the sections where they're not supposed to stop these kind of people. They're not taught that at all. They put those blinders on these police officers. And I like police officers. A lot of them are my friends. There are some that's just a ornery, rotten wife beaters, okay? But most of them are pretty good people. They're just the most uneducated people out there doing their job. And they're just following orders. And they don't care as long as they follow orders and 
keep their own ass out of the fire. That's all they care about. In 49 USC of the United States Code, section 49, 13505, section 13505, transportation furthering a primary business in general, <clears throat> neither the secretary nor the board has jurisdiction under this part over the transportation of property by any motor vehicle. If the property is transported by a person engaged in a business other than transportation. See, what is the definition of transportation in the United States Department of Transportation Code? It's the same in the USC, okay? What is the definition of transportation? <clears throat> What's that? Goods under contract for interstate commerce. That's what it says. Goods under contract for interstate commerce. People under contract to haul other persons. And all public servants in the performance of their duties. That means not when they're driving home in their personal car. Only when the public servant is in their performance of their duties. They have to, then they're regulated by the transportation code. Those are very important to understand. The transportation is within the scope of and furthers a primary business other than transportation of the person is exempt is exempt. If you're not doing those three things, you are exempt. And one of the things we've been learning recently is you can do an affidavit and send it to your local DMV or Department of Public Safety or whatever it is that runs and regulates that in your state, and you can send an affidavit that you are exempt because you are not operating in one of those three things. And they're required to put it on their computer system. So when a police officer pulls you over, it says exempt. And most of them won't even pull you over. They'll read your license plate, the state plate. And when he runs it in his car behind you, traveling down the road at 50 miles an hour, it'll come on his computer and says you're exempt. Now, I didn't know that. That's something we recently learned. License plates have a barcode on them. Well, they will change it in their computer too. Once you know you've been changed in their computer system for anything, even your own status, and you know that, then when they come up to the window, you hand them your passport and you say, check your, check your computer, run my passport. And usually they walk right up, back up, hand you your passport and you're done. And when I got arrested on the 10th, they didn't run my passport. He never made it past the back tire on the way to his car when he got the radio call. And that's what affected my arrest because they didn't take any of my information right there. They waited till I was already at the jail being booked in and he sat down on the computer and he wrote up his tickets and he did all that. And they still hadn't done it. They still hadn't checked on me. When I got arraigned and I went before the judge, he says, these aren't tickable offenses. Get your fine paid now that you've been in jail, and then you can get out. They still hadn't checked on me. They didn't check on me until I went to the police station with Bobby to pick up my AR which they wouldn't let me have because it's under investigation until they figure out it's not stolen or whatever. And Bobby says, I want you to do a thorough check on this man. That's when they did the check. 
They had to be told to do it. They did the check that night after we had left their office. And the next day, I'm wiped off the face of the planet with the county. And Bobby and I, the minute we went home, we pulled up my record. There it was, even my old ticket that I fought and won. And there it was, my arrest record, my everything. It was all there. The next morning, poof. You can pull it right now. Run David Strait's name in Johnson County, Texas, criminal records, and there will be nothing. It says, nothing found. See? But they had to check my status, and they had to be told. They didn't do it. That's a failure on their part. Wrongful actions by any corporate entity that bring upon a private living man an injury must be recompensated. Must be. A corporate government serving papers on a living man is abuse of process because a fiction cannot serve papers nor cause injury or harm to a living man. Write this case down that I just read from. Trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward, Waters, Pierce versus Texas. Trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward and Waters uh, hyphen Pierce, P-I-E-R-C-E versus Texas. Those two cases right there say the same thing. Trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward and Waters hyphen Pierce versus Texas. They're liable for the prohibited transactions. In 856 of one and a half million dollars per penalty section, your police department isn't even listed under the county, under the revised code of Washington State. So this is something I used to sue one of the officers in Washington State that stopped me. Okay, so I wrote this part of it. How is this group of individuals who are contracted with Interpol, the Washington State Police are contracted with Interpol, and have anything to do with me upon proof of claim that they have any jurisdiction over me at all or that they can do anything on a road that they don't own. Oh, you see, that's, did you, you recognize the beauty of this whole thing right there. It hit you hard and he's laughing. The state of Washington, the state of Michigan, are private for-profit corporations with Dun & Bradstreet. Years ago, I was involved in the lawsuit. I took a hydroponics piece of equipment that my company manufactured from Bend, Oregon, to a little island off the coast of Maine and delivered it. In fact, I used a rental truck to pull it with pull the trailer with and I went through the state of New York and on interstate freeways I ended up paying $190 worth of tolls to get through the state so I got pissed and I put the word out Imagine how $191 spent wrongly, and you know it's wrong, right? I got the word out to some of my people of New York, and we all got together, and we sued the state of New York, and we cost them billions of dollars because the state is a private for-profit corporation, and the United States is a private for-profit corporation, and they are two distinct and separate things. And I wanted to know how the state of New York, on an interstate freeway, regulated by commercial code, 
could charge a toll and make money off of people who technically aren't entering the state because they're on an interstate freeway owned by the United States government, funded by the United States government's taxpayers, and paid for at the pump. And the state of New York had to move all of their toll booths off the interstates <laughs> onto the off ramps, and they had to provide rest areas with gas stations, food, so that people could stay on the interstate, technically, without getting off into the state of New York and get fuel and the things they need to continue on their right to travel. And we won. Now, you know how much that cost the state of New York? They went from, I don't know how many toll booths, but it wasn't that many, to hundreds of toll booths because they had to put them on every off-ramp to toll you getting on and off the interstate instead. They had to rebuild New York and put rest areas in New York. You know what we charged them? Nothing. Just do it. We made nothing off that. I'm going to tell you about another case I fought in New York. You might remember from watching some old videos of a United States Navy pilot, very good friend of mine, very smart, who got arrested traveling through the state of New York at one of those rest areas. He was moving somebody from like the other side of New York, New Hampshire or somewhere, to Idaho, and he was helping a friend move. And he had his pickup in his trailer, and he had his 45 service uh, weapon in the glove box. Well, let me tell you, in Idaho, I don't think there's a truck travel on the road that doesn't have four or five weapons in it, right? That's the way we do things out there. So he was driving through the state of New York, pulled over at one of those rest, rest uh, stops to get fuel, and the state police officer pulls up at his trailer and didn't like the, his trailer for some reason. And did an illegal search and seizure of his pickup when he told them, no, I do not consent. And they found that 45. And in the state of New York, if you travel with a weapon, you can't have any bullets in it. They got to be like in the trunk or against the tailgate or, you know, like, hold on there a minute, carjacker. <laughs> Just a minute. I got to go get my magazine. Okay, I'm ready. You understand how freaking stupid that is? And you think they have no carjackers in New York? And you have an unalienable right to protect yourself and your family? Man, I usually have one right here, one right here between the seats, and one under the dash. Maybe sometimes one in the door. Those cops are probably still shaking their head from April the 10th when they went through my pickup of what they found. And I'm sure they played a long time with uh, a little intelligence agency knife that I can put in my belt and walk right through security at the airport and they won't even see it because it's made out of carbon fiber. I still have it. It was in the door and they left it there. Yeah. So these police officers are making you offers to contract. Understand this, this is important. Offers to contract, that's all they do. Create that cause of action, that offer to contract, okay? And you usually accept it. Stop it. Stop accepting it, just quit. Just say no, it's like drugs. Put an international no symbol, 
Just say no. I don't contract. Stop contracting with them. Stop giving them your tacit agreements. That's an unwritten contract. Stop doing that. Now, under the threat of force or duress or coercion or violence, do what they tell you to do nicely. Don't get shot on the side of the road. I love you guys. I don't want you dead. Don't do that. But then you go after them later. They're not the guys to argue with. This is where I have a problem with my wife. She is full frontal attack on everything and doesn't pick, she is, and she does not pick her battles well. Me, I know how to handle them and what battles to fight and when to fight them, and then I just freaking destroy them every time. That's a smarter way to do battle. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and believe me, I've had to like drag her off. There was a little gal who called us. She lived about maybe two miles from our office. Called us. She's in the bathroom of her apartment, and the police are there to arrest her and serve a warrant. And a couple of us were in the office, and we jumped in the car, and we went there, and we got out of the car armed. But her boyfriend, the whole way there, we're on the phone with her. Okay, we're a mile away, we're a block away, you know, telling her how far. I said, stay calm, don't open the door. If they didn't open the door, then I could have had a conversation with them and probably solved the situation. Just before we pulled up, the boyfriend opened the door and walked out and let them in. And they went right in, kicked their bathroom door down, and I'm so proud of this little girl. She got it all on video, and she just about choked that officer with his own tie. She's a little bitty thing, little bitty Puerto Rican. <laughs> Fire, <laughs> fiery little thing. And she tore them up and he, he's telling his partner get her off me I can't breathe his face is turning blue she's got him by his tie and she's a, he's a great big guy all dressed nice he's a he works for the district attorney directly and he has a ponytail She's got a hold of his ponytail, her knee in his back, and pulling on his tie. I was so proud of her. See, it was an unlawful warrant. It was an unlawful warrant. Through an illegal search and seizure, where she had a prescription drug that they didn't know what it was because it was in a plain bottle. She didn't want to take the whole bottle of pills with her, so she took a little bottle and she filled it full of pills because she had a medical issue and it was prescribed. They didn't even test it. They called it fentanyl and it wasn't and they didn't test it. They just ticketed her, searched her vehicle, arrested her, took her to jail, put her in solitary confinement for 10 days. She had a little hearing after her arraignment, which basically judges run over the top of you in arraignment. Are you guilty or innocent? Or plead guilty or not guilty? That's all they say, right? That's all you get to say right now. This is just an arraignment. Are you not guilty or guilty? And they just ran over her. And she said, not guilty. Okay, then you're going to trial. So they just threw her in solitary until her court date gets put in. Who did she harm? 
Where was the victim? She said, I don't give you consent. It was on their body cams to search her car. They did it anyway. It was in the dark at night. She's tall, small, framed woman, very pretty. She didn't feel very comfortable. She's not from around here. She was born in one of the islands. Well, I forget which one she told me off of Cuba or something. I don't know. Anyway. And she called us for help. You know what happened? The partner was standing on the stairs blocking our stairway up to the apartment until his partner was calling, screaming for help for oxygen. And then he left. We went up the stairs to the door. His partner got free after he muscled her off and got his tie loose and was breathing. And then she's sitting on the floor in handcuffs and his partner on the ground getting his breath back said, okay, I got it now. And he went out and took care of us and pushed us down the stairs basically and made me stand up against my pickup armed. And I'm telling them all the damn things they're doing wrong and how this is wrong from the beginning. And we're going to make sure no matter what you do to her, we're going to make sure you guys pay a penalty for this and pay for it. And we're going to help her sue you. And about then, about 20 officers showed up. Cars were coming from who knows where. Three cities. These are little towns. This town has like 7,000 people and a college in it. That's all it had, you know, so... The police department is a separate company, corporation from the county, who is a separate corporation from the state, who is a separate corporation from the federal government, who is a separate corporation from Washington, D.C. themselves. And the county has a, not only the police department, but the court is separate corporation from that, you start adding it up in one case, how many corporations you just dealt with. Now you pull all their records, all their financials, do they pay their bills on time? I can tell you the Supreme Court of Arizona does not pay their bills. Their 120 days average payment cycle, that's 90 days late, past due, okay? And their credit limit has been reduced on Dun & Bradstreet down to $3 million. That's all the amount of money the Supreme Court of the state of Arizona could even borrow. Go sue them for $10 million and they'll go bankrupt. So you, you understand their private for-profit corporations aren't even managed properly sometimes. And when you find out that like the state of Oregon has 1,600 private for-profit corporations just under their ju judiciary. I did not say that very well. Judiciary. <laughs> <coughs> then you start to learn who you're dealing with. The ordinance officers that come out, who are they with? What corporation? Find out. Your job, the minute someone comes here and says, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. No, they, don't, they never say that. <laughs> Your job from that first second on is information gathering in the event that you may sue. You write the officer's name down. You write who they're from. You find out what corporation they are. You go on Dun & Bradstreet. You get their, their Dun & Bradstreet number. You find out who runs that agency. Who's responsible? Who is their agent of service? Ah, this is where so many people lose. 
If you go to sue an agency and sue an individual in that agency that did you wrong and you put the agency in your suit and you didn't serve the agent of service, that might be somebody way over there in some office across town or across county or wherever. And you don't know who they are. See, Joe R. Biden Jr. is listed as the agent of service for the White House Office, Inc., your new government. Not even the freaking United States of America. That's Trump. Absolutely they do. It's on our Telegram channel, by the way. Print off right off DN, Dun & Bradstreet. It's got the Dun & Bradstreet number, the agent of service, the address, everything. It's called the White House Office, Inc. That's the name of your new government, that, the actors and pretenders. I'll tell you, one of... One of Biden's actors, because he died three years ago in Bethesda Medical Center, one of his actors is a British actor. That's what he does for a living. And he's playing Biden. But there's more than one. We've, facial recognition software through the intelligence world has, there's been four since he took office. Four different people. And sometimes on the same day, they'll use two. All right, this is important. Definitions per Black's Law Dictionary. Sixth edition. Look up the word privateer. It's on page 1195, by the way. A vessel owned, equipped, and armed by one or more private individuals and duly commissioned by a belligerent power to go on cruises and make war upon the enemy, usually by preying on his commerce, a private vessel commissioned by a nation by the issue of a letter of marquee to its owner to carry on hostilities by and through that he was operating as a magistrate for the executive branch of government, a police court was obligated to inform the defendant of his liability, the nature and cause of the accusations he failed to do. The failure to do turns the court into a kangaroo court and creates an additional injury, and it is a felony to use one's office de facto or otherwise in the capacity of a debt collector to collect a debt without the requisite evidentiary proof of the debt giving rise to the obligation and the resulting liability. And it is considered RICO under 18 U.S.C. 1951 through 1968, particularly 1961-3. Without showing liability on the face of the instrument, the prosecution has failed to state a claim under the FDCPA in 28 U.S.C. 3001. That was a beautiful, beautiful court case. And I'm not gonna read the whole darn thing because it goes on a couple pages. And it goes on that in April of 1856, an international agreement by the United States, Spain, Mexico, and Venezuela abolished privateering in 1856. April of 1856, they abolished privateering. This is the reason police vehicles are known as cruisers. Conducting inland piracy. That's exactly right. See? Man, can't even make this shit up. All governments, 
Barack Obama said this on January the 28th of 2011. He said, all governments must maintain power through consent and not coercion. Do you think that little police officer had my consent? <laughs> they pointed a taser at me. A lethal weapon to force me out of the car. And I was being a little snippy but nice. I was snippy with a smile, which I'm pretty good at. Ronald Reagan said that we're a nation that it has a government and not the other way around. We're not a government that has a nation. We're a nation that has a government. And this makes us special among the nations of the earth. Our government has no power except that granted by its people. Our government has no power except that granted by its people. He said it is time to check and reverse the growth of government which shows signs of having grown beyond the consent of the governed. Ronald Reagan said that in 1981. Insurance is a private contract with no legal or lawful requirement to inform the public. Since the state claims ownership of all material goods, if they hold title to your car, they own it and require surety from those that have usufruct of it. So if they don't have title to it, they don't own it. It's beautiful. All public corporate agents, judges, attorneys, cops, courts, bailiffs, the mayor, right down to the dog catcher, are all acting as unqualified debt collectors and illegally assess the estates as unqualified heirs. This is why you can go into court and demand a W-9. Take it right up to the court clerk and say, Your Honor, I need to, bailiff, I need to give this to the, to the clerk before we start. I need that filled out by the time we're finished. <coughs> this is mainly financial stuff. Anyway, you get the hint. I don't have to go through all these pages. We have rights. God gave them to us, not the Constitution. Don't ever use the words constitutional rights. We don't have any constitutional rights. In fact, all citizens have none. They only have civil rights and privileges. Civil rights and privilege. And the definition of privilege is when they've removed a right and what you do a thing under a license or registration. That's the definition. We all have not had a good education. We all went to the same public school system, kindergarten through 12th grade, and none of us got educated. Not one of us. And now we've got to unlearn that and learn the right things. And this is the biggest problem. The only way we can fix stuff is to know what's right and what's wrong. And God gave us that discernment and he gave us unalienable rights. And the greatest of all these rights is the right of self-determination. That's our foundation. Our cornerstone, the rock that we build our homes on and our lives on. It is the right of free agency to make a decision between what's right and what's wrong. To make choices in our life. As Bonnie says, every one of you make 10,000 choices before you even came here this morning. What shirt to wear, what underwear to put on, what jewelry to wear, how to fix your hair. All those, did government regulate? Believe it or not, they did. Some of them. They tell the toothpaste companies what to put in your toothpaste when you brush your teeth in the morning. 
The most dangerous aisle in a supermarket, I was told this by a dentist, the most dangerous aisle in a supermarket is the toothpaste aisle. It's the most poison. And you, and you put it right in your mouth. You've got to be kidding me. Write this down. Lacto, L-A-C-T-O, bacillus, don't ask me to spell that one, <laughs> salivarius, lactobacillus salivarius, salivarius, saliva. It's a natural occurring bacteria that occurs in the human body that we spend our life killing every day. And we need it. We kill it every day. By our toothbrush, our toothpaste, our mouthwash, alcohol, hot drinks can burn bacteria easier than it burns your mouth. Okay? And we spend our life killing this. We kill it with even apple cider vinegar will kill bacteria. Colloidal silver will kill bacteria. It's a natural antibiotic. On and on and on, even if we're trying to do good, we're constantly killing it. You know what that means? We constantly need to be putting it in our mouth. Now, here's what I recommend. Don't just take the capsule and swallow it. It goes where it's not needed, down here, if you do that. Take a tablespoon, set it down on the table, open two or three capsules into the tablespoon. Put it on your tongue. Push it with your tongue all over. Work it into your teeth, your gums. Use your finger if you have to. Work it into your mouth all over. Do you know it will rebuild your teeth? It will clean your teeth? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you. Lactobacillus salivarius. Okay? You can buy a couple hundred tablets for like six bucks on Amazon. All right, not a problem. I'm teasing you anyway. I'll tell you what, anybody with gingivitis or any kind of mouth or gum issues takes it away. Takes it away. Let that bacteria work for you. That's why God put it there in the first place. And we just spent our life killing it. Very, very important to our health is our mouth and our teeth. It begins the digestive process. If your saliva doesn't have any bacteria in it because you've been killing it with alcohol and other things, mouthwash kills it. Then our food doesn't even digest well, and what happens then is we build up mucus in our intestines. Our intestines have these little feelers inside of our intestinal wall. I know. <laughs> I'm trying to make this simple for everybody. We build up mucus, and then as our food and our nutrition pass over, there's not much for it to absorb. And then we can eat well and not get the nutritional content we need just because of the mucus buildup. I have a recipe for that. I make it every six months in a glass jar. It takes about two weeks to make. You take it. It cleans the mucus, it kills everything, it heals your gut, heals your stomach, you won't get heartburn. It heals it. You can use the solids that settle to the bottom of the jar as a pretty good steak marinade. It's very good for you. Flavors, lots of ingredients. All natural, organic ingredients. Huh? Well, put it this way. At least 25 to 30 people a day ask me for the recipe, and I just send them an email. 
All you do is type me an email that says recipe. And you'll get the recipe. Okay? So, then replace. Do that about once every six months and clean your system. Gets rid of that mucus and then replace it with good probiotics. Like Delamine 5. It's a great probiotic. And that builds your immune system up. Okay, Del, D-E-L, Immune, V. It's their fifth generation of their product. Just type that in your search engine, it'll pull it right up. <clears throat> Del Immune 5 or, or uh, Del Pro, or both. And then you won't be going to the doctor as often either. Once you do those things and you fix your gut, nutrition enters your body and heals yourself. Okay? It's important. Stop eating fast food. <laughs> What's that? They're trying every way possible. All right. This is where everybody has a problem, you guys. That's our introduction into the criminal justice system. And a lot of our teenage kids and 20 year olds work their way in pretty fast through the Department of Motor Vehicles and our police departments. And they work into it. And it actually develops, statistics show it develops a life of crime sometimes where they just, you're just a troublemaker, aren't you? And they arrest you throughout your entire life. I have a cousin like that. He's probably been in prison. He's two years older than me, 62. And he's been in prison most of his entire life. And he'll go to jail for a year, go to jail for five years, go to jail for two years, go to jail, and be out a year, be out two years, be out five years, and then all of a sudden he's in jail for five years again. I mean, just one thing after another. And it's not because he's doing anything wrong anymore. He learned his lesson when he was young. But, he built a reputation. And the police officers all know who he is. And if something got done wrong, well, it's his fault. And they show up at his house. He's in jail right now in federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas. And they got him in a hospital at 62 years old. And he's there because he knew some drug people. And the police came to him and says, will you help us? Will you help us catch them? And he says, if you'll wipe off my criminal record, because I've had a hard time getting a job that pays anything. I'll do an exchange. And these are federal guys that did this to catch some higher level drug dealers. And they handed him drugs. To, they handed him drugs. And then they told him to go to him and make a deal. And they told him how much to sell it to him for and everything else. And then turn him in. And he did. And they didn't hold up their end of the bargain. And in one drug arrest scheme, they snatched him up with them and put him in prison. The rest of their operations yeah, they didn't have any need for him anymore. Their operations running smooth. That kind of stuff pisses me off. Where are we at on time, Rob? What's the, what's the time? 
Okay, we got one hour. All right, good. All right, let's uh, let's go into land patents a little bit, if that's okay. You need to get up. Okay. Higher tiers are good. All right. Sometimes this is my favorite part and my best time to laugh at myself. Don't you laugh with me. Don't you dare. The United States, not a cow. <laughs> All right. This is important to understand. So, we created the federal government. Do you know what the word federal means? You don't know what the word federal means? No, oh, this is beautiful. Federal, believe it or not, is a contract from man to God. Most people don't know that. And we cuss the federal government. And we're cussing our contract from man to God. Yeah, it's interesting. Took me a while to learn that. Because I used to cuss the federal government worse than most. See, it doesn't mean they're doing the right thing in their contract. But we gave the federal government 10 square miles. Forts and ports and other needful things. We didn't give them millions of acres of U.S. forest land in Oregon and California and Washington and Millions upon millions upon millions of acres of Bureau of Land Management land. If you're on the East Coast, you don't deal with the BLM very much. In the heartland, they deal with the USDA a lot. But on the West Coast, my gosh, you can't do anything without being a part of either BLM or Forest Service. Constantly fighting BLM or Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management. So, George Washington divided this nation before Washington, D.C., divided it into federal districts. How many districts are there? Twelve in the 48 states. Twelve. Canada is 13, and Mexico is 14. Mexico is the 14th district of the District of Columbia. Biden actually confirmed that in one of his executive orders. He says, Mexico, Canada, and the United States makes all the decisions together. Isn't that interesting? Canada, you can read it right in the Articles of Confederation. When were they written? 1700s. And Canada was part of the United States. Well, what the hell's Castro's son up there doing? <laughs> you laughed at that, right? That's because it is. Castro's son, understand. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I'm going to tell you something that's probably going to piss a lot of you off, and you're not going to believe me. A lot of you are going to believe me on it. But it took me a long time to really nail this down. No American has ever voted for the President of the United States of America. Your vote has never counted, not in one election forever. No senator is supposed to be voted in by the public either. And that's in the Constitution. We're supposed to vote for our Congress. Our senators are picked in the state and the reason they are appointed, supposed to be appointed, is so that the vote isn't bought and they're supposed to appoint two, two senators for each state as a checks and balances on Congress. What is a Congress? It's a group of baboons. Literally, that's what it is, by definition, a group of baboons. Their job is to control the, and direct the purse. There's supposed to be a bunch of accountants that do benefit in trust for Americans, and we're supposed to elect those guys to represent the will of the people. Government is the will of the people. When was the last time they did your will? Right? So the will of the people is supposed to direct Congress. Congress is supposed to find the money to pay for the things the will of the people needs based upon the contract of the 19 essential governmental services that we asked for and contracted for and agreed to pay for through tariffs. We never agreed to pay for them through income tax. The 16th Amendment was never properly ratified. Title 26 of the United States Code is the IRS Code and it's not law. Okay. This is important to understand. The only fair tax is a tariff. A tariff is where we, where we sell our goods and services to other nations. Now that other nation might be Michigan to Illinois. And a tariff is collected between the transactions. But if we sell to Michigans, Michig thank you, that just wasn't coming out. Michiganians, that's too much. Michiganders, that sounds like a goose. Okay. If we sell to each other in Michigan, <laughs> there shouldn't be any tax. But if you sell to somebody in Illinois, you're supposed to collect a tax, or New York collect a tax, or, <clears throat> and that's to fund government and it's to fund the 19 essential governmental services, and I'm talking about federal government, the 19 essential governmental services that we agreed to pay for and no more. And it's the and no more that's the most important part of the equation. It doesn't say free phones and welfare for, you know. Have you, who's got a telemarketing call trying to get you disability when you're not. They spent money to hire telemarketers and advertise to bring you in and call you disabled when you're not. I got two phone calls in the last two months. I said, do I look disabled to you? She goes, I can't see you over the phone. I said, call me on FaceTime next time. 
and I hung up on her. <laughs> Twelve districts. See, I used to live over here, and my zip code was 97702. And by the sheer use of my zip code, I put myself in a federal district of the District of Columbia, and I called myself a resident of Oregon. Huh. Legal, yeah, I needed CPR back then. Legal definition of a resident is someone there temporarily to do business, and by the sheer use of my zip code, which I voluntarily wrote on everything, I was in a federal district, so that, that allows the FBI to come to your home, arrest you, and they would have took me up to Portland. and put me in the federal building in the ninth district and my paperwork at the court would have said the ninth district of the District of Columbia versus David Lester Strait. Well, where the hell's Oregon? They took it out of the equation. Who gave them that right to do that? Me, by the use of my zip code and calling myself a resident, a citizen, and a, I knew she was going to get, a person. Citizen, resident, person, you need CPR. Get rid of it. You're a dead entity. You need to, somebody needs to give you CPR and bring you back to life. They can't regulate the living. They can only regulate the dead. And one dead deer on the side of the road is just as dead as the next dead deer. And all U.S. citizens are dead entities in the law. And there's tons of case law that says that. Tons. And then you act as purser or person, which is an office of, aboard your vessel, your all caps name, and they send that to you in a presentment to your zip code, to an address that the U.S. Government Postal Service, another private for-profit corporation, gave you, and it's not the meets and bounds description of where you lay your head and choose to inhabit. It is not that. It's SMU. It's shit made up. And we never gave them the power to create, so they couldn't make shit up. So we let them, by our ignorance, see, when I married Bonnie, and I first went to our home in Texas on the 15th day of September of 2021, we got married on the 31st of August, and I did five seminars between the time we left and the time we got home, and we got married somewhere in the middle. Five seminars in a row without being home, living out of suitcases. And we got home and drove up in our new driveway on the 15th of September, 2021. And as she pulls in the driveway, it's got a gate that's locked. You gotta get out and open, unlock the gate. I get out to unlock the gate, and I look across the street, and there's a mailbox with a postal address number on it. I said, Bonnie, I'll unlock the gate in just a minute. And I walked across the street, and I put my shoulder underneath the mailbox, and I pulled it up out of the ground. And I walked over and I tossed it in the back of the truck and it got thrown away at the dumpster at the office the next morning. And I said, Bonnie, you've already told me you put the property in land patent. You cannot get mail here. You got a post office box. You go sign up for Amazon delivery. You get a street address of the post office with a number of your box, and that's what you use for all commercial activity, and that's where everybody sends you presentments. 
not where you lay your head in private. You have to separate your private life from your commercial activities. If, if you have and get mail at your private home, even if you've gone as far as your land patent, you have defeated your purpose. Completely defeated your purpose. So when you land patent your property and you post your sign, no trespassing, with your fee schedule on it, and you put private fences with gates, and good fences make good neighbors, keeps them all out, lock that gate, post it, and put it on the public record, not even the police will come to your property unless they're called and invited. They'll park in the neighbor's driveway. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Put your fence where it's supposed to. Doesn't matter. And in Texas, you paint your post tops purple, and it shows them that it's a land patented property. I don't care which one you use as long as you keep your personal life away from your private life. There was some suggestion of having to get one through uh, the, the CPS store. I don't care <laughs> which one. They're all private for profit corporations. Take your choice of who you want to contract with. That's called taking dominion over that juris. When you don't separate your jurises, you're not taking dominion. And God commanded you to take all three and subdue them. He didn't say jump out of the water onto the land with both feet and stay just there. Never. And I guarantee you if you do that stuff, The wave will come crashing down upon you and you'll run out of breath and drown because you didn't take dominion over the air, the land, and the water. And I guarantee it will happen. Don't. Debtors rent. Debtors rent. Own your own land. If you have to, start somewhere. There's nine square feet for sale right there of patented property in Texas. Go buy it. Go talk to Dave Wagner back there. Go buy it. And you will own a piece of land patented property and let me tell you why that's so important. Because you can't move into equity and access your trust until the king owns land and you tie yourself to it. That judge told me one of the three things I needed to do was tie the marriage of my wife and I, which was done in the Bible, not through a state license, to tie it to the land. See, we recorded the front, a picture of the front of the Bible, a picture of the page where we were married with the signatures of who officiated and the witnesses, the date, the time of the event, and we recorded that event on the land. But we did not tie it to where we lay our head. You have to tie it to the property. So we had to do an affidavit tying it to the meets and bounds description of our land patented property and get it recorded. 
and our county would not allow us to record. We had to fight with the county. So we ran down to the next county down, Hill County, they recorded it like it was nothing. Here, here's how much it is. Recorded it, had it back to us in 10 minutes. We ran back and we filed in a court case and we went and had a hearing, tried to move the court into equity, and the judge says, you have to have it recorded in this county. I said, is that a court order? He said, yes. So we went to the county recorder's office, told them what just happened in the courtroom and that it was a court order. And the judge says, we have to get this recorder there. And the girls are so scared of a county attorney that they wouldn't do it. I said, you just violated a court order. And we fought with them for several days, back and forth, and going to the county attorney and getting back, and they, they're scanning it and sending it over to them via fax, and we're trying to get this approved so that the county recorders could record it in the county. And that's when Bobby got the brilliant idea of what to say. God put it right into his brain, and he said, let's go before I forget. He wouldn't even tell me on the way there because he was rolling it. It was just, he, You should have seen him driving. It was like... He was, I'm serious. And he walks in that office. He says, here, you hold the phone. You record the whole thing. And he was, and shut up, he says. <laughs> he didn't want me to talk. And he was brilliant. Bobby Lawrence was brilliant at what he did. And he got a police officer to witness the whole thing. And while he, while he put the county recorder as an assignee and a trustee of the trust of the matter before the court and held her under the Power of Appointments Act to do her oath and record the documents. And she goes, I understand what you're saying, but I can't do anything without the signature and okay of Bill Moore, the county attorney. Go tell this to him. So we jump in the car, we drive over to the other courthouse where Bill Moore's office is in the county. Yeah, I said your name on camera. And we did it, he did it again. We leave the courthouse and within 10 minutes, she's calling us saying, okay, you can record. Because we pinned him into a corner he can't get out of. Legally, see, it's beautiful. I bet he was looking shit up so fast when we were walking out. <laughs> That's a land patent number in Oregon. The numbers get a lot smaller farther east you get. That's an example of a no trespassing sign. That's a pretty good one. It's put out by narlo.org, the National Association of Rural Land Owners. National Association of Rural Land Owners. And you can order these. They come on a aluminum frame. I'm not going to carry a bunch of aluminum around with me. <laughs> so I laminate them so you can see them. <clears throat> this is an actual land patent. And if you're in any of the 48 states except Texas, 47 states, these are held by the Bureau of Land Management, except a few of our oldest patents that are held by the 13 colonies. Now, that's a different story. Those are probably some of the easiest land patents to get. Bureau of Land Management's not hard to get either. The hard thing to do is to trace your lineage of your property back to that. But you don't necessarily have to. Okay? You have to have a grant deed. So federal law says this. All property in the United States of America shall be held by land patent. All property shall be transferred by grant deed. All property shall be described in meets and bounds. Boom. 
That's it. That's all you got to worry about. So land patents were of various sizes, sometimes 640 acres, sometimes 1,000, sometimes more, sometimes 320, sometimes 160 acres. And you might own one little chunk of it. So there's a one little part of a sentence you got to put in there. Land patent number 043860, a part and parcel thereof, described as, in this quarter section of this section, from this marker, 63 feet to this corner of the property, all the way around your property, and describe it in a meets and bounds survey written format. That's meets and bounds. I've gotten rid of FBI warrants because they didn't put the meets and bounds of the property they were going after on their warrant. And I've said, you didn't have a valid warrant. They said, why not? Well, there's a number of reasons on this one. The judge signed it 14 days later. You wrote her name on it. And I have her signature, and they don't match. Second of all, the address wasn't put into meets and bounds. It had some kind of postal address on it, and it wasn't even right. You idiots wrote down the house next door. The judge just goes, this is a federal judge. He just goes, Out of 3.4 million warrants served by the FBI last year, 865 of them were good. 3.4 million, there were 3.4 million warrantless searches and seizures last year. 865 of them were good. From an agency that shouldn't even exist, it has no congressional charter to even operate. That was created by a secretary of the Department of Justice in 1908. To cover up crimes that the deep state commits and had no authority by Congress, no congressional charter to even exist. And they operate strictly on the consent of the governed through forced duress and coercion. They even show up at the county and tell the county sheriff, hey, this case right here, we're gonna take this thing over. Where's our office space? And the sheriff clears out one of his deputy's offices and says, you can use that. It's because he's an idiot. He's a compartmentalized legal idiot. He doesn't know that the FBI doesn't have any authority in his county, and his job under oath is to protect his people, and he should kick him out. He has the power over them. He has the power over them, and he doesn't know any better. Because Why? Well, gosh, they have the, all the money in the world behind them and the best forensics there is, and they've got to call in a Learjet to come take them out to a crime scene. They will. And the rest of the time, they drive a brand-new black Suburban and dress in suits. That's their only authority. Do you know when I put on the Missouri event a year or so ago? They had the city cops come out. We're out in the county with this event. They had the city cops come out and block off the streets. This is the morning, Friday morning before it started. The city came out, blocked out the streets. The FBI shows up, the state police show up, the county sheriff shows up, and the city cops show up. A little caravan. And they drove from a long ways away. Clear across the state of Missouri is where the FBI office is. 
And they show up there. And we tell them they're not allowed on this property. It's private. So they stood in the street. They said, we want to question David Strait. David Strait's in the room with his wife. The seminar building is just filling up. I'm staying right next to it, 20 feet away. And it's filling up with people. They're there. They're blocking the streets. There's cars lining up, coming to the seminar, and can't get to it. Wondering what the hell's going on. Some of them turned around. Don't be chicken. This whole movement is shuffling the wheat from the chaff. Okay? There's weak people that don't belong here. Be a lion. And then me relaying information on what to say over the phone to Rodney Brown. He's telling the FBI what I'm saying on the other line, and they want to question David Stray. And I told Rodney to say, David says he's happy to answer any questions you may have as soon as you can provide a copy of your congressional charter. And they jump back in their cars and they leave and all the cops drive back into town about 15 miles away with their head hanging down like this. In about a minute and a half, I got rid of the FBI. And I said, Rodney, as they're get closing the door, tell them to truck up on down the road and find somebody else who will bend over. Because it ain't me. I'm telling you, that ain't the first time I got rid of them, and it sure ain't going to be the last. They come to most of my seminars. I keep trying to discern which one of you they are. And I really could care less. I had a guy come to the Kentucky seminar. No, it was the Columbia, Tennessee seminar. He came. I did a Bivens statement, which I haven't done here today because I don't think there's one in the room. What's that? Oh, I don't care. Hey, welcome. See, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I'm not doing anything wrong or illegal. All the laws on my side. And once they figure it out, the faster they figure it out, the better off we all are. So tell them to come. Let me deal with them, not you on, at your home. <clears throat> I'm happy to have a debate. Okay? So anyway, one came to the Columbia, Tennessee seminar, and I did a Bivens statement. Everybody know what that is? Okay, Bivens versus six known uh, unknown agents of the Fer Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, I think it was. Yeah. And it's a case, case law. And it says, if you put them on notice and read that statement in a meeting of assembly, that they can't come in and use any information that you say for nefarious purposes to hold against you. Because we have the right to freely assemble. We have the freedom of speech to say whatever the hell they want, even if they don't like what we're saying. And I'll tell you what, by the time they're done with my seminar, they're usually my friend. Okay? And he walked up to me. He didn't reveal himself like they're required to do under Bivens. If I asked, and I asked, and I asked three times, and you're supposed to ask three times. So I, read, I did the Bivens statement, I asked three times, and nobody raised their hand that they were an FBI agent, and he sat through the class all day on Friday, all day on Saturday, and on Sunday morning, I'm up there putting my mic on, I'm on a stage about this high, and I'm up there putting my mic on and getting ready, and he comes up to me and he walks up the stage with a yellow piece of paper in his hand. And it was just out of one of these yellow books you take notes on. And it's all folded up with my name on it. And he says, David, I just want you to know that I am that FBI agent. I came clear from the FBI headquarters. And 
and I came for nefarious purposes, you know what my report's going to say? And I said, yeah, that we don't do anything wrong. He said, that's right, and here. And he handed me this yellow paper of his notes. And it also told me a whole bunch of things the FBI is doing of nefarious purposes, including how they moved their FBI headquarters out of the District of Columbia into Alabama. And that's where the FBI headquarters are now on the Army base at Huntsville. So is NASA's headquarters, by the way. They're moving everything out of D.C. because they know it's going to be gone. Watch the movie 2012. Now, the, that was based on the Mayan calendar, which was wrong, which thought the end of the world was going to come in 2012. They were off by 11 years. But it's pretty fun to watch, okay? It's one of the most accurate descriptions of what's going to happen. Now, we get done with the districts and they divide the districts into states, including one called Michigan. Don't laugh at my artwork. <laughs> and they divide that into states, 48 of them. Don't count Alaska and Hawaii. They came in after the UN agreement. They're United Nations nations who joined the states. But they're United Nations nations. We are, are a United Nation nation as a whole, not as an individual state where Alaska and Hawaii are individual United Nations nations. Okay? So 48 states except for Texas. Texas never ceded their land back to the United States when they joined the Union. That makes Texas very unique and very important and an example on how we can take back the Republic. And everybody can be a part. You just got to buy a little land in Texas and call yourself a Texan. Now, you know what a Texan and a Texian is? This is something I didn't know till fairly recently, but there is a big difference between a Texan and a Texian. And the Republic of Texas was teaching us that in the Republic we're Texians, and in the state of Texas we're Texans, and that's not true. And I'm calling them on it. A Texian is a white Anglo Saxon within Texas. A Texan is an Indian or Mexican within Texas. Boy, did that take me a while to figure out. A lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of history to figure it out. So I'm calling the Republic of Texas out on that very fact. All right, all these states divided themselves into counties. Don't laugh at my artwork. Into counties, and we have 3,144 counties in the United States, 3,144. And your house is somewhere in that county. And when it comes to your land, it needs to be recorded in that county, your property in that county. And your county recorders are obstructing justice, especially in the state of California. 
they're obstructing justice. And many of them in many counties won't allow you to record your documents. And the Lee Resolution on January the 2nd of 1776 is one example of why it's important for them to record anything that we the people think is important enough to put into the public record, even if it's written on pencil, with pencil on a napkin. That document was so important. We have the signature of the 13 members of each of the colonial states and the vote of the uh, congressional session, the, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say, guys? Congressional con uh, Congress session where they met the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists who decided how this country was going to grow and go further and to set aside our freedoms and our liberties. And they voted and it counts the vote right on that napkin, the yeas and the nays. And it writes it out, our freedom and instruction to the king that we were no longer under his control, that we were free men and that was recorded and sent in pencil on a napkin to England. And had it not been recorded, we wouldn't have proof of that document now. So someone, our founding fathers, felt it so important that it should be put as a notice on the public record that it got recorded. And when we, the people, find something so important, like our affidavits, that they should be placed upon the public record to record them, they damn well better record them, and the federal law says they must. They're our public servants. We don't work for them. They're our public servants. They work for us, the people. And every constitution of every state says that in Article 1, Section 1, or Article 1, Section 2. It was that important. In Texas, it's Article 1, Section 2. In Oregon, it's Article 1, Section 1. Where government is created by us. Where we, the people, are sovereign. And they're, cre they're created to protect our peace, safety, and happiness. And they can at all times. We have the right to alter, reform, or abolish as we think necessary, proper, expedient. Different states use different words that all mean the same thing. And they're all in our state constitutions. And every public officer who's elected has to swear an oath to that constitution of that state and to the United States under the Supremacy Clause. And they have to swear out those oaths. And their job is to follow it. I've taken that oath three times. To protect and defend this nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And to follow the laws of the Constitution of the United States of America and the states in which I took the oath. Nobody can take that away from you. Once you take that oath, they can't take that away from you. As long as you don't go out and be a traitor or treasonous, they can't take it away. It lives right here. It's yours. It's your oath. Okay? It's pretty bad when we find out that our biggest enemies are... You think that's what domestic means? They're foreign to us. Washington, D.C. is a corporation under the crown of England. 
General George Washington was a English soldier. And when we created the Grand Army of the Public and the UCMJ, which was the laws that run it, he became our commander in chief and our highest general. And then he became a year later president of the United States of America. Commander in chief was first. 1775. Military is the only way forward. What we need to do to stop this is get them to dissolve the Posse Comitatus Act because all courts are under the jurisdiction of the military who cannot act in civil matters because of the Posse Comitatus Act. Congress, who created the act, tied their hands and put the military in cuffs. They can't get involved in our personal civil matters. Now, that I've got that out of the way, they can get involved when their public servants do the wrong thing. And we can prove that. In proving that, we can't talk about our case. We can't give them the facts of our case because our case can't matter. They can't get involved in our case. So don't talk about your problems. Talk about what they're doing wrong. And then CC the Provost Marshal General's office. And let them investigate behind the scenes. They're good at it. It's not your job. Go file it in federal court through the Department of Justice the right way. Go expose your grievances through a remonstrance to your legislator and go CC the Provost Marshal General's office. Okay? Get Ron's book. The first hundred pages is law. Tells you all about patents in the very front, the different patents, then it's law. On page 114, tells you how to put your property in land patent, unless you're in the 13 colonies or Texas. And the only difference is in Texas it's easy. Texas has a one page form. It says provide these eight items and those fees and send them over to the office and they'll send you the land patent and they'll record it for you. That's how easy Texas is. Pay the fees, get them the information they want, and they'll record it for you. The 13 colonies are the hardest because you've got to figure out where the land patent's located. And all the rest of the states, it's just call the Bureau of Land Management, show them a map where your property is, in what section, township, and range, and what the legal description is, and tell them you want the underlying land patent and you want four certified copies. And pay whatever fee they ask for and get those. It's not expensive, right? Yeah. How much? Dollar fifty a piece. Really? I think I paid more than that in Oregon. But in Oregon, BLM runs the show. There's not a not a town over 10,000 people without a BLM office in, it, in Oregon. In fact, some, some towns with 1,500 people have BLM offices in them. So, very, very important. Page 114 tells you the process, what you've got to do. Ron's books are great. Now, once you've got your land patent, you think the county gives up on trying to charge you property taxes? No. They'll mail you a property tax bill. In fact, the law says they can try for three years to get you to recontract. Three years to get you to recontract. And that's okay. It's their attempt. It's fair game. So you get your property tax statement in the mail, make a whole bunch of photographs of it, 
It's usually one page. Make a whole bunch of photographs of it and then circle all the errors. Because see, governments steal your property by administrative error and get your acceptance and then it's theirs. And everything on it's an error. Go ahead. Now what about the real estate on it? Anything you add to the property, the house or something, is that still taxable? Land, Land, when you got a land patent signed by a president of the United States to his successor and or assigns forever, you were required to do improvements and pay a small fee to get this. I think this one was signed by Andrew Jackson. I saw one from Pennsylvania, land patent number 71, signed by John Adams. And then somebody sent me one from Ohio, which was land patent number one, signed by George Washington himself. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> you can actually look it up online. Google it. Say that again. You have to correct the errors. And they will try for at least three years. And sometimes they'll still fight with you. And you've got to be a little more forceful with 72, 30, 15, 10, Judgment Day. No. It recontracts with them. You just gave them consideration. You just screwed up. No. Once you're free, don't voluntarily pay to go to jail. Okay? It's kind of silly. Think about it that way. What you do is you make multiple copies. You circle each error. You make it exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C, exhibit D. It's all the same page, but you got to correct one error at a time. So you correct that error. You put that in an affidavit in one paragraph of your affidavit. And then you go to the next error, and you circle that, exhibit B, and you put that in the second paragraph of your affidavit. And you circle the next error. And then you say, I'm happy to accept this if you can prove or you correct all the errors. Right? And they're all administrative errors. They're all shit made up under policy or statute. Rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow, and they hold you accountable because they, your consent of being a citizen, person, or resident makes you a member of their corporation. Now you're an employee. If you walk into Walmart to buy something, do you have to follow the same rules as the Walmart employee? No. You're just there to do a little commerce. The Walmart employee gets an employee handbook manual that he's got to follow. If he don't, he can get written up or fired. <clears throat> so just don't go to work for Walmart. You see what I mean? What do I do with that drink? I look like I'm drinking all the time, and I hardly get through a whole can a day. So, all right. I think we're done then. What time you want to come back? Tell them. 2.30. We're going to break for lunch. The people online.